It's 1928, and a group of the world's most successful financiers met at the Edgewater Beach Hotel in Chicago. Here they are, the president of the largest utility company, the greatest wheat speculator of the day, the president of the New York Stock Exchange, a member of the president's cabinet, that is the United States president, the greatest, quote, bear in Wall Street, the president of the Bank of International Settlements, and then the head of the world's greatest monopoly at the time. Collectively, these tycoons controlled more wealth than there was in the U.S. Treasury. And for years, newspapers and magazines had been printing their success stories and urging the youth of the nation to follow their examples. Love. We are in 1 Timothy chapter 6. I think the screen says that too. I hope so. You follow the screen and, and I'll follow along with, with the rest of you. Would that work? 1 Timothy chapter 6. As you're turning there, as oft at the beginning of a sermon, a question. Another question. I guess I started with a question earlier. But do you like and the word there, your first blank, money. Money. Do you like money? Is it wrong to like money? And Kenzie's saying no. Now, usually for a sermon, you use a, a, a dollar bill, or you, you might use something else, but with inflation, a dollar bill isn't worth as much so I'm using a $5 bill tonight. But who wants this $5 bill? All right, Alan's, I think, the first hand to go up. We have quite a row here. Anybody else? I see Ethan. He's kind of scratching his chin going, mm-hmm. Yeah, there, there's something to this. You know, he's a little, little, it's a little sus here, a little suspicious of this. All right, what? One gallon of gas. Okay, maybe, maybe a little change. Kenzie, hold on to that. Okay, I might want it back later. You got it? I'm never getting that back, am I? <laughs> Everybody likes money. And no, there's nothing wrong with liking money. There's nothing wrong with having money, enjoying what you can spend, what you can buy, what you can do with money. But if nothing else were true, than just that fact alone tonight that most, if not everyone in this room, most, if not all of us as human beings, we like money. You could add to that, we like things. We like thing, possessions. But if that was the only thing that was true tonight, I think that would be enough to say a conclusion from that fact that we might need to take a step back and examine, re-examine. We might need to, on a, a pretty frequent basis, do some self-inventory. Keep watch on our souls. To make sure that we don't start liking that money just a little too much. For the Christian, it's about contentment. Our statement for this evening is a bit of maybe a, I hope it's not a tongue twister, but a bit of a play on words. Not, not, not really, but a bit of, I guess, as I said. It's that contentment is not about less, but it's also not about more. All right, making sure I, I, I got it right. Okay, I was thinking for a second there, wait, did I put more first? <laughs> Wouldn't really matter, but I like to try to stay in sync because I can. But that, that's what contentment is, or what it isn't. But by that, you get what it is. By being content with what I have at that moment, in that moment. It's not about, well, I don't need to have so much money because then I might not be content. That's not contentment. Or, I, I, of course, we, we usually get this one pretty easily intellectually. Well, if I have, have to have a lot of money, well, then I'm probably not content. But it's not really about the amount, the dollar amount, the assets or whatever. Contentment is outside of that discussion. It's on its own. Being content. Let's open up to that chapter, 1 Timothy chapter 6. I have for us this evening three portions of this chapter. We do have to 
hop around some to get this, but three different sections about love, about money. The love of money. The love of money versus the love of Jesus. And so we have tonight contentment, pretty easy to guess that one, then desire, and then hope. Contentment, desire, and hope. Contentment. 1 Timothy chapter 6, beginning at verse 6 tonight. The first five verses are about slaves, and really the chapter break, this is just Gant's opinion, might have been better at verse 2b. And depending on your English text tonight, I think most of us have a paragraph break there. Do you see that, where it starts with teach and urge these things? And so you have slaves that get a verse and a half or so, as, as we have it divided in verses. And then 3 through 5 are about false teachers. And one of the ways that this then leads to money is because part of that discussion is false teachers are in it for the money. They think somehow that teaching about God and even trying to live for God, godliness, is going to produce financial success for them. And that leads us to 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 6 through 8 as he describes a combination, a combo, and then the results of that. Look at it in verse 6. But, and I'm going to stop you right there, or stop myself right there, and point out that the word but, B-U-T, shows up five times in our English Bibles in this chapter alone. And four out of five are in our portions of this chapter for our study tonight. You see that even right here in 6 through 10, but, but, so but. In contrast to those that think somehow teaching the gospel is going to make them rich, and that's why they're in it, but, he says, godliness with, here's your combo, contentment. That is great gain. Now already, Paul, through God's, divine spirit is redefining some terms here, isn't he? When he says here, great gain at the end of verse 6, is that monetary gain or is it something else? Go back to content, or go back to godliness. It's the idea that as a child of God, as a, let's say, a member of Jesus' family, if I have Jesus, another way of saying godliness, if I'm living for Jesus and I have Jesus in my life, then I've found the greatest treasure, the greatest gain. I have everything. What is that statement? I preached it a while back. I'm not the first person to say it. That everything minus Jesus equals nothing. But Jesus Godliness for our text tonight, when I'm learned to be content with that, therefore Jesus minus everything, or my, plus nothing. See, I'm not a math guy, okay? Plus nothing equals everything. That's what he says. You, put, you have this content heart. And the word for contentment for their time is about self-sufficiency. But that's not what Paul says. He doesn't say when you learn to just have yourself and you're happy with yourself, then you're good to go. No, we had to bring in that godliness part. This is being content in Jesus. And then he has verse 7. Verse 7 begins with 4. You'll find that word three times in this chapter as a term of explanation. The word 4, F-O-R, It's actually in the chapter more than just three times, but it's three times where Paul says something in one statement and then he backs it up or adds some explanation behind it. So he says, here's the idea. You're content because you're godly and that is the real gain. It's the real wealth that defies earthly wealth. It's spiritual wealth. 
before, he then says, we brought nothing into the world, and we cannot take anything out of the world. You could go back to Job, in Job 1, verse 21, when Job has lost everything, he's still alive, and he still has his wife, kind of. And Job says this, slightly different words. He says, we, we came here just with, yes, the life that God gave us. And I know this, this is stating the obvious. And this whole sermon on loving money and not loving money, isn't that, you know, that, that's obvious. But the problem is that disconnect. That we get it. And we say things like money can't buy happiness. And then, when I say we, I'm, I'm, not, I'm just speaking of, of us, and not, not really necessarily even as Christians, maybe as a world, but then we spend our lives chasing the almighty dollar. Because people in the world say that too, don't they? They write books about it. Money can't make you happy. But then every, just about every advertisement and just about everything that you see in the world is meant to make you want either something money can buy or to just have more money. Pile it up. Again, I'm not saying. Is it wrong to save money? Is it wrong to have nice things? You're thinking, yeah, this is why we can't have nice things, Gant, because you preach sermons like this. But for real, that, that's not the problem. It's not wrong to want a better job or a promotion or any of those things. It's when that keeps me from being content. And when I forget this fundamental fact. When you make an, an insurance, life insurance policy, who gets the money? You ever thought about that? When that check or that deposit is made, if, you, if your name is on the policy, who's the check made out to? It's not going to be made out to me when I die. Or the Spanish proverb. See, these are all just ways of, of attacking that same idea. That there are no pockets in shrouds. You know, today we tend to put people in nice suits when we bury them, and they, they might or may not have pockets, and Brad maybe could fill us in on some of those more details, and we don't want to know those details, really. But that's what he said. And then, in the next verse, verse 8, he says, But, another one of those contrasts, if we have food and clothing. And I'm sitting here waiting as I read verse 8 for Paul to add, that thing that goes over your head. Because that's also what we say, isn't it? Food, clothing, and shelter. Paul doesn't say that. Now, I'm being a bit facetious there because I do think, I, I think he's using these two words, food and clothing, as a way of, of wrapping up all the, the idea of basic necessities. Like if you, if you had asked Paul or if you asked the Holy Spirit, does that leave out shelter? Like, if I'm under the bridge, under the overpass, but I've got decent clothes and I've got a meal to eat, are my basic necessities taken care of? I don't have a nice roof over my head. I don't, I don't think he would say, no, no, I left out shelter because you don't need shelter. I think maybe that, that is missing the point, okay? It's fun to play with. Because the point is about being content with having those basic needs met. He isn't saying that if you're starving... Be happy with that. Be content to have an empty stomach all the time. That'd be, that'd be too much for us frail humans to be asked of. He says with that, we will then be content. How much does it take? 
How much do you need? We've already said it's not wrong to want more than you need. It's not wrong to... How much more? I think I already hit the button, right? Yeah. Isn't that the, the answer? Just a little more than I have. It's like one of the Rockefellers was asked that one time. He's like, how much money do you need to live comfortably? And he said, just a little more than I get. Contentment. Contentment. Let's read the next two verses that add to this with now desire. First Timothy chapter 6, 9, and 10. We have another one of those. He says, but those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires. So desire to be rich leads you to other desires that are clearly problematic. And then that, he says, plunge people into ruin and destruction. So I wrote it down as the fall. We fall into all these other temptations. That Money is this road that leads you, and there's all these other sights to see and enjoy along the way. You, want, you start wanting money too much, and you, start, you get selfish. You only think about yourself and your pocketbook. It's like power that we talked about a, a week ago or so, that when you get money, you either want to be able to make sure you can spend that money on something you enjoy, or you want to be able to use that money to get more money. And again, those can be innocent things until they lead you into a snare. That's, that's my goal. I wonder how many people at some point in their life had that. They might have even said it, or at least at the subconscious level, that was their life goal. 1 Timothy 6, verse 9. To get rich. Isn't that why so many things like get rich, get quick schemes, why those work? They're still around? The people that sell them still make money? Get rich? Quick. Can't get any better than that, can it? And then you look at the families that are torn apart. And I'm not blaming the money. You look at the people that have mental health issues. And th those are a couple of more extreme examples of the end result in verse 9. Like the fella that the policeman finds him by the lake and he's just staring in the water. He's like, fella, what are you doing? He says, I'm, I'm trying to remember. I know that there's something more important than money. But I can't figure out what it is. I just can't remember. This isn't, this isn't supposed to be a joke. Before you laugh too much, before you smile too much. And the story goes on that they, they had, they, he ended up in a mental institution because he, had, he literally had just lost all concept of anything but money. More money. Now, that's not going to happen to most of us. It's not going to be that obvious. But 1 Timothy 6, 9 isn't just about the extreme cases. And then you get another four. Here's the second one in the chapter, verse 10. This one, if I had to pick of this chapter, it might be the quotable quote. 1 Timothy 6, verse 10, for money is the root of of all evil. Does that sound right? Well, that's not right. It might sound right because that's what we hear. I haven't heard it in quite a while, thankfully. Maybe it's finally kind of passing out of circulation. Money pun for you. But he says the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. It is through this craving Look at that, craving. Like you, you sit down with an empty stomach for that meal you've waited for all day or all week, that juicy steak, and then it gets there and you cut it open. And, mm. Is that how we treat money? The craving 
But some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pains. We're kind of back full circle to the end of verse 9, the end of verse 10. Love money. We have to come to a place in our hearts, whether that is tonight, this week, whether you've done it or not, where you make that decision. Jesus or money. I don't mean you can't have any money or you can't have lots of money if you have Jesus. I mean 1 Timothy 6.10. Do I love Jesus or do I love money? Because according to Jesus, I can't do both. Isn't that what he says in Matthew 6? You cannot love God and money or wealth or things. It's that old Aramaic term, mammon. Matthew 6, 24. You can't do it. How does that work, though? A root of all kinds of evil. You, might, you could probably think tonight of a certain kind of evil that's not about money. But then if you think a little more, money's there somewhere. Whether it's a sexual sin, do you, do you know how big the pornography industry is right now? It's the biggest export in this country. I'm reminded of, I don't know if we got any Castle fans in here, the TV show. I'm reminded of a saying on that episode. It's always about catching the murderer, right? And there's a saying there that murders are always committed for one of three motives. It all comes down to one of three. For love, for to cover up another crime, or... You guessed it. Money. Money. Does it cost? How many things can you do that don't cost any money? I'm persuaded that some of the best and greatest things you could ever do don't cost money. But the greatest valuables in this world can't be bought with the money. Like real love. Companionship. And there's things you can do that might be related to money. Like reading a good book. Yeah, you bought the book. You might, you might have been given it, so there's that. Somebody bought it, but the activity itself doesn't really cost you any money. And I, it seems to me there's a trend within our culture where everything has to cost money now. You can't go do something fun and enjoyable without having to pay somebody to do it. Does it cost? And then somebody says, well, everything has a price, right? And time is money, and money is time. And I know that on a certain level is true when it comes to work, but if you work by the hour especially, but I don't really believe that's true. Not really. Maybe time is one of our greatest assets that we waste more than anything else. Last three verses, 1 Timothy chapter 6, 17 through 19. We see contentment here up against desire and now hope. Hope. 1 Timothy 6, 17 through 19. He first talks about haughty hope. I put those together because you haven't figured it out yet, I do like alliteration. I try to tame it in as much as I can, but sometimes it gets the best of me. But he says in verse 17, as for the rich in this present age, they have to do what Jesus told the rich young ruler, they can't stay rich and be a Christian. That one doesn't sound right either. Or, once more, it may sound right to some, but it's not what the text says. Think about it, the chapter starts with slaves, ends with Christians, that whatever that meant for them, whatever it means today, and rich is a really relative term, right? Everybody in here tonight is rich compared to the majority of the world. 
keep that in mind. But you've got the slaves and the rich and their Christians in the same church where Timothy is. As for the rich, in this present age, charge them. Well, you might take note of in this present age, they're rich. But charge them not to be haughty. But have a little more than you have. Oh. Okay. That feels pretty good. Isn't there a reason Paul writes things like that? This isn't some distant thing where you just read it and you go, okay, yeah, the rich people shouldn't be haughty. Because with a little money in our pocket makes us... These are some potential pitfalls and temptations that he heads off. He says, no Lord to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches. But, there's your fourth one, on God. Now what a contrast that is, right? We said Jesus or money, hope in money, that rightly so is the uncertainty of riches, or put your hope in the God who made the world a foundation solid and secure. We live in an oil and gas world here in Elk City. So you don't have to think very long or look very far to see the up and down, the booms, and then when things crash. You don't have to anywhere in this nation, in a lot of nations right now, you don't have to look very far past the gas pump or the grocery store, or the utility bill, to see the uncertainty of riches. That's the word I used earlier, inflation. And that's just one piece of the big puzzle. And we'll, we'll end there in a moment. He says God is the one who richly provides. You see that? Rich, riches, richly. He provides us with everything to enjoy. You see, it's not wrong to enjoy life, to enjoy what money can give or what money can't buy. And then, in verses 18 and 19, he puts more of a twist on riches. He says they are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share. And he repeats himself there, I, I think, isn't it for emphasis? And it provides some balance. You're ready to share and generous from your heart. Thus, verse 19 continues the sentence, storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation. I'm putting money in a treasury that is certain, not uncertain, 19 back to 17. And then that treasury turns, before I finish the verse, it turns into a foundation. Storing up, he says, a foundation for the future. So they may take hold of that which is truly life. It's real. Money can, tries to convince us that it will bring real happiness and that it will give you the life you always want. And no, Paul isn't saying that you can buy your way into heaven, but he is saying that there is a correspondence between the way I use what I have whether it's a million dollars or one dollar, between that and the treasure that awaits in heaven. Hope. What did we sing a minute ago? I appreciate Shane accepting that request tonight, kind of last minute. To trust in God, hold to God's unchanging hand. We see the value tonight of contentment. The danger of a desire that takes root and leads to all sorts of other problems. And then the hope that is either set in the things I can hold on to or in a God who's, hold, who's holding on to me. Do you like money? Kenzie, do you still have my $5? Can I have it back? Is it easy to give it back? No? Do you want to give it back? Are you going to give it back? Okay. <laughs> Point made. From the youngest to the oldest, 
We like money. Contentment, then. Contentment might be one of the most evasive hearts, dispositions ever. As we sing this song together, I'd like for us to think about how we use the things of this world and to think about where our love really is. The Christian is to love God and love people. I, we teach our kids, and I think I've said this before, so it's a good reminder that you love people, you like things. Now, if you're not a Christian tonight, what a way to describe becoming one, to turn away from what will not provide true happiness, the world, with all of its gifts, and to come to the treasure of the heart. As Christians, then, we get to grow in our love for God as hopefully our love, our desire for money shrinks a little more. What happened after 1928? Do you remember the greatest wealth in the world? 25 years later, this is what had happened to those men. The president of the largest independent steel company, lived on borrowed money the last five years of his life and died broke. The greatest sweet speculator died abroad penniless. The president of the New York Stock Exchange ended up serving a term in Sing Sing prison. The member of the president's cabinet was pardoned from prison just so he could go home to die. The greatest bear on Wall Street committed suicide. The president of the Bank of International Settlements committed suicide. The head of the world's greatest monopoly committed suicide. And then, I, I didn't write this, but it's very aptly put, all of these men had learned how to make money but not one of them had learned to live. Let's be people who don't live for the mighty dollar, but who live for the treasure, Jesus. Let's stand and sing together.